Good morning, everyone, dear Madame Lagarde, dear Mr. Weidmann, Mr. Issing, Claudia Buch. She's not only a member of the board of the Central Bank, but also a member of our university board. So one of the many examples of the wonderful links we have between Bundesbank and Goethe University, and also one of the wonderful examples of growing women's power in the world of university of knowledge and finance. So it's my absolute pleasure to be able to welcome today Madame Lagarde, who's not only, as I have learned, the cover lady for influence and power in the world of finance, even in, in respectable journals, so this is a good one, but also a role model for many of us in the area of management development and equal opportunities. What is Frankfurt? You probably know Frankfurt as the banking capital on continental Europe. Indeed, we have about 72,000 bankers in this town. Some cynics say actually it's in these days more regulators than bankers, but um, I might add one piece of fresh information for you. We also have more than 70,000 students and scholars in this place, so we are not just a banking capital of Europe, but also a capital of knowledge and education. Um, we are in the building of so the so-called House of Finance, which is basically a merger of economics people and law scholars, and um, a lot of our research is dedicated to not only do research in banking and finance, but also in banking and financial regulation. For example, we run a research program that's called SAFE, Sustainable Architecture of Finance in Europe, and that's programmatic, so I guess Frankfurt has really, and Goethe University, um, promoted a shift from studying banking to also studying banking and finances environment and embedding it into the societal um, environment. That's important to all of us. So um, I guess Frankfurt is the perfect place for you to be. Goethe University is the perfect place for you to be. And um, 2015 has been pretty successful for Goethe University. In many respects, we have been able to grow our external funding budget, which is very important. And we have been able to increase our equal opportunity record in our board. We have four of 10 women now in our executive board. We have three women and three men. And among the newly recruited professors last year for the first time in our history, we also have 50% women. So it is possible. And I know that you're very much involved in these questions as well. So welcome to us. And we're all looking for your fascinating talk. I have to disappoint you, not yet. Uh, you have to bear with me for a couple of, of minutes. Chair Christine, uh, President, uh, dear Otmar, by the way, a belated but very cordial happy birthday to you, Otmar Ising. You turned 80 uh, a few days ago, and it's an enormous pleasure for all of us that you agreed to moderate the Q&A part of this session today. <laughs> If I could, I would sing, but I spare you uh, this, this adventure. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning uh, to everyone. It's a pleasure and a privilege to welcome you to the joint lecture of the SAFE Policy Center, the Center for Financial Studies, and the Deutsche Bundesbank. Today, as you've noticed by now, I hope, our speaker is Christine Lagarde, the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. And it's a long-standing tradition that the managing director of the IMF delivers a policy speech shortly before the IMF World Bank annual meetings, the so-called curtain raiser speech. And this year, Christine, you opted for Frankfurt as the right place for your speech. I congratulate you on that choice. It's a very good choice and a great honor, not only uh, for the University of Frankfurt, but also for Deutsche Bundesbank. Ladies and gentlemen, Christine Lagarde hardly needs any introduction. 
She was appointed Managing Director of the IMF in 2011 and has just been elected to serve for a second term without any rival candidates. And this is a clear sign of just how much appreciation there is around the world for her work at the top of the IMF. But while Christine is well known for her central role in international finance, few of you probably know that she was also a member of the French national team for synchronized swimming and won a bronze medal in the national championship. So in a way, one could say that she was always destined to take a high place in the rankings. Today, as we've already been pointed, as has already been pointed out, she's often included in the list of world, the world's most powerful people. And this may be due to the fact that over the past years, she has been at the forefront of fighting one economic and financial crisis after another. Before moving to Washington, she was first France's Minister for Trade, and then its Minister for Economy and Finance. It was actually during this time, Christine, that we first met. At the height of the financial crisis, the French and the German governments were pushing for a global response to the crisis. The strategy was to bring the coordination of crisis response efforts to the level of the G20 heads of government, and I'm convinced that this strategy turned out to be the right choice. Not only because this established the G20 as the key body for international economic cooperation, but also because it helped prevent the world from falling back into trade uh, protectionism, which I find is one of the biggest achievements of the G20, and moreover, it also laid the ground for better financial regulation. In her role as Minister of Finance, Christine also helped shape the response to the euro area sovereign debt crisis. And now as the managing director of the IMF, she remains deeply involved in the sometimes dramatic negotiations of the assistance programs for some euro area countries. And we could notice some of that drama over the past few days, I guess. In fact, the IMF has become an indispensable part of these programs, not least because it has a wealth of experience in designing assistance programs that really get to the root of the problem. Of course, even a vast amount of experience is no guarantee that recommendations will always lead precisely to the expected results. But that said, there is another asset that the IMF brings to the rescue programs in the Euro area. It assesses the situation independently, almost free from political considerations and the necessity to compromise. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can imagine, combating the economic crisis of recent years makes for a busy schedule. Indeed, rumors have it that visitors to Christine's office in Washington can spot a small sign on her desk that reads, there can't be more crisis this week. My calendar is already full. Christine, this makes me happier still that you have found the time to visit us in Frankfurt today and to share your views on the global outlook and policy priorities. It's probably safe to assume that you'll give us a preview on the topics we will cover in our discussions at the IMF Spring Meeting in Washington later this month. And one, one of the main purposes of the IMF's biannual meetings is to reach a common understanding of the state of the world economy and to identify appropriate policy responses. And I think quite successfully at that. At our past meetings, we have often been confronted though with a downward revision of the economic outlook. And we frequently discussed whether monetary and fiscal policies should respond and how should they respond to these downward revisions. Monetary policy in particular has been very expensive for a very long time now. In fact, seeing monetary policy as a global panacea would clearly be asking too much of it. And in light of the currently very high public debt levels in many countries, the scope for fiscal impulses is also limited. In the medium term, only productivity boosting reforms conducive to employment and growth can lead to sustained higher growth rates. In particular, as the frequent overestimation of global growth rates can also can be seen as an indication of a lower than expected potential growth in the world economy. 
I'm therefore pleased that we, the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors, agreed in February under the chairmanship of the Chinese presidency to further expand the agenda for structural reforms. And I'm convinced that global growth prospects will improve if this agenda is rigorously implemented. By the way, this would also lead to greater investment, which is currently subdued not only in the euro area as a whole, but also in Germany. In fact, considering the already very favorable financing conditions, it seems to me that structural reforms and reducing also the political uncertainty around the world are the key factors in raising investment. Ladies and gentlemen, contrary to what some may believe, the IMF is not just an important creditor for cash-strapped euro area countries. The IMF was initially established to ensure the stability of the international monetary system. And this also remains its primary objective today, although its mandate was updated in 2012 to include all macroeconomic and financial sector issues that bear on global stability. Just over six months ago, you, Christine, said in another curtain raiser speech that, and I quote, the adoption of the 2010 quota and governance reform is essential to reflect the dynamic change in taking place, taking place almost in almost all our membership, and to ensure that the fund has the resources that are needed to respond to our members' needs today and tomorrow. The good news is that the 2010 IMF court and governance reforms took effect on January 26 this year, enhancing both the legitimacy and the quarter resources of the fund. And after having completed this long, and I would add exhausting exercise, the next general quarter review is already underway. In view of this, Christine, I'm most interested not only to hear your current assessment of the global economic outlook, but also to learn what you currently judge to be the most important challenges to the work of the IMF. So ladies and gentlemen, I won't keep you waiting any longer. Thank you very much, Christine, for coming, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, cher Jans. Um, as you will have noted, we both speak French. Um, President Weidmann, President uh, Wolf, Professor Ising, dear Claudia, thank you very much for having me. Thanks to the Bundesbank and uh, to Goethe uh, University for hosting uh, this event. And thank you very much uh, to the professors, uh, to the students uh, who cared to uh, to come around this morning, despite the fact that I understand that you're not really in session at the moment. So I highly appreciate uh, your, your presence here. I'm, as usual, uh, very pleased to be back in Frankfurt. As uh, you mentioned, Madame President, uh, Frankfurt is clearly a financial center of prime importance, uh, not only in Germany, but in, in, uh, in Europe, I would say. Uh, and uh, it is clearly the home of one of the oldest, if not the first independent central bank in the world, the Bundesbank, uh, famous for uh, this independence with its history of notable presidents. Uh, I'm not going to refer to present company, uh, but certainly Karl Otto Pohl, uh, Hans Tittmeier uh, are coming out clearly as, as those leading figures who uh, marked uh, central banking and independence uh, for, for history. And of course, uh, I would like to pay tribute to you, University, uh, Goethe University, not only because one of my closest friends actually teaches in this university, not only because 50% of the professors are women, congratulations, uh, Madam Professor, uh, but also because it has driven excellence in the academic world for decades and uh, has inspired some of the world leading thinkers. Amongst whom, indeed, uh, a towering figure uh, whose name I hope I pronounce properly because us French uh, do say it differently, but your famous son, uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, uh, a writer, a philosopher, a scientist, a musician, a statesman, and I also think a truly international figure. I would call him an internationalist for that matter. Um, 
not just because he's read and translated across the world, but also because he was a very well-traveled man, very early on, went on to his Italian Grand Tour, uh, wrote Persian-style poetry, penned Sanskrit uh, literature, and yet find the found the time to be a global diplomat. So he was just a world's genius who knew the world and who understood the world as a composition of different parts, but which formed something that was truly integral and a whole. And these are the two themes that I would like to use, the interconnectedness of the parts and the internationalism that he depicted and embodied so well himself. Because I think that as critical as they were then, they are equally, if not more, critical today. In the face of destructive forces, some of which struck as recently as in Brussels, in Lahore, um, we, the world, must stand together. And solidarity in the face of those adverse development is clearly critical. Likewise, if we are to overcome the risks and concerns that currently beset the global economy, we must also work together. It is another one of these imperatives. The IMF, as you reminded us, Jens, was actually founded with that imperative of cooperation in mind back in 1944. And this, this is precisely what the 188 nations will come to debate in less than two weeks in Washington on the occasion of the spring meeting. I say 188 with trepidations because there will be another member joining uh, the IMF next week. So I will not announce yet, but we have another member joining us. Not a huge one, it's not Cuba for those of who, you who try to speculate. That maybe will come in due course. But. So what will we be debating? Well, some of us will want to focus on good news. We are not in the middle of an acute crisis. We are actually growing, and that is good news indeed. The not so good news is that that recovery is too weak, too fragile, and its durability is at risk. Now, of course, we have made progress since the great financial crisis. But because that growth has been too slow, too fragile, a lot of people are just not feeling it. And this persistent low growth can be self-reinforcing through negative impact on potential output that can be actually hard to reverse. The risk of becoming trapped in what I have called, now a year ago, this new mediocre has increased. And this has consequences for the fabrics of our society in many countries, even in Germany, where the economy has been strong. So we can do better. We must do better, but to do so, politics have to go further, and the policy mix has to be more potent. So let me be clear. I'm not raising the alarm. I'm saying that we are on alert. There has been a loss of growth momentum, but we believe that if policymakers could be determined to act together to confront the challenges that I will address in a minute, Jens, the positive effects on global confidence and the global economy can be substantial, and we can get back on track. So what I would like to discuss briefly before we move to Q&A &A with you, Professor, is what are exactly those challenges that we're facing? What kind of individual actions can country take with courage? And finally, what kind of international cooperation do we need to harness in order to get the most out of these individual actions? Let me just turn to the global challenges. I'm not going to mention numbers because we disclose numbers precisely next week when we publish the World Economic Outlook. But overall, that global outlook has weakened further over the last six months. So you can elicit from that that there will be a slight revision. 
And that has been exacerbated by three factors. One, which is China's rebalancing business model and a relative slowdown as a result. Lower commodity prices, probably for longer. And the financial tightening as prospects, as well as, as reality for many countries. So under these three factors, the baseline has slightly moved downwards. Emerging markets for many years had largely driven growth, contributing up to 80% of that global growth. And the expectations was that as they were slowing down because of a change of business model in some, because of downturns in others, then the advanced economies would pick up the growth baton and would carry on, which hasn't really quite happened. Because in those advanced economies, the recovery is more moderate than we had expected. In the United States, growth is flat compared with last year, and partly due to a strengthened US dollar. In the euro area, if you combine low investment, as you have mentioned, weak balance sheets in some corporates, in some banks, as well as high unemployment, not in all countries, but in many, then all those combined factors actually weigh on growth. And if we look at Japan, clearly both growth and inflation are weaker than expected despite the policy response. And while emerging markets are not any longer that cohesive group that was described once as the BRICS, they are facing different circumstances, which all lead to the same results, lower. China, as I said, is shifting its business model, and as a result, is having good growth. You know, 6.5 is nothing to be ashamed of, but it's significantly lower than what they had experienced and what their suppliers and the supply chain had experienced. Russia and Brazil are experiencing significant downturns, more so than what we had expected. And that is also true for the Middle East, which is the prime region which is suffering from the low oil prices. There are also quite a few African countries that are suffering as much as the Middle East countries and that are less talked about. India, by contrast, in that category, remains a bright spot with strong growth and rising real income. The same applies to ASEAN five economies, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. They are performing well, while at the same time on the other side, Mexico is doing quite well, and some of the Latin American countries are actually taking the hit of a significantly depreciated exchange rate, but are resisting nonetheless. If we look at the last few months, not weeks, few months, we have, and the world has experienced, significant economic and particularly financial turbulences. But since that, the sentiment has improved, particularly over the last few weeks, driven by further easing by the ECB, an apparent shift to a slower pace of rate increase by the US Fed, and a relative firming price of oil, as well as lower capital outflows from China. So, we can be complacent again. We should welcome all this. Well, we contend that we cannot afford to be complacent. In the absence of decisive action to address those lingering problems, downside risks remain and have probably increased. And we don't see, except in very spotty places, reasons for upside risks. So what are they, those risks? For advanced economies, they relate to long-standing crisis legacies, high debt, low inflation, low investment, low productivity, and for some, high unemployment. So everything that should be low is high, everything that should be high is low. In some countries, not all, in some countries, balance sheets of banks and increasingly non-bank financial institutions are strained by non-performing assets and low operating profit margins. For the emerging and developing countries, risk relate to rising vulnerabilities. Lower commodity prices, higher corporate debt, 
volatile capital flows, and for some countries, de-risking and reduced bank lending. And these risks should not be looked at in isolation. They have a macro-financial dimension, as you have mentioned. And this could, in adverse circumstances, create feedback loops to sovereign balance sheets. For example, implicit guarantees often given to large banks, or implicit guarantees given to state-owned enterprises that take a hit from falling commodities or change of circumstances. This, what I've called in my early days as finance minister, this incestuous link has not been severed yet. Moreover, each of these risks can be the cause of spillovers that cross border with greater frequency and force than ever before. And indeed, our research indicates that spillovers that used to be understood as spillovers from advanced economies to the rest of the world, well, these spillovers are also moving now the other way around, from large emerging economies markets to the rest of the world, as we saw ever since August 2015. And that is channeled through trade, through commodities, but also through financial markets. And for those of you who've read the Financial Times this morning, or who have already read the GFSR, uh, clearly those financial risks are nascent in many ways and could develop further. Speaking of trade, global trade has significantly, significantly slowed down and financial stability, financial stability risks have increased. So given all these dynamics that could become self-reinforcing, that are two-way streets and no longer one-way street, global financial stability is not yet assured and needs strengthening and strong policies. Now, those were the macroeconomic and macrofinancial risks as we see them. In addition to that, you could certainly argue that there are, there are economic and financial consequences resulting from political and geopolitical risks that abound at the moment that do not contribute to confidence, but rather feed uncertainty and fear. And here, you know exactly what I have in mind. It ranges from terrorism, the repeated appalling attack on innocent li lives, the silent threat of global epidemics, conflict and persecution that force people to flee from their home, as a result of which many people wonder whether their way of life let alone their life, is actually safe and secure. And that uncertainty and that fear extends beyond the countries that are under conflict. It goes beyond, it reaches many coastlines. It's Jordan, it's Lebanon, it's Turkey. It's some of those brave European countries that also feel the consequences of these geopolitical situations. And here I would like to salute Chancellor Merkel and the German people for their leadership in those difficult times and facing those hugely important challenges. I can see on a regular basis, firsthand, the respect that Germany has won around the world for its deeply humanistic approach to the refugee issues. History will remember. And as if all that was not enough, on the top of it, you have this yawning gap in individual fortunes, manifest in persistent, excessive, and rising inequality. It is captured by many studies. The most famous ones, of course, are those published by Oxfam, and I won't go into the details of those. But certainly what is happening at the moment and the topic of so much media coverage is not going to help in the context of that rising concern about excessive inequality within borders. Because inequality on a global basis, cross-country, has been declining. But that's on a global basis, not on a domestic basis in most corners of the world. So it is no wonder that perceptions abound that the cards are stacked against the common man and woman in favor of elites. 
So these frustrations are leading people to question established institutions and international norms. And to some, the answer is to do exactly what we managed to avoid in 2008, as you reminded us, Jens, to avoid protectionism. The temptation is to say, well, why don't we just look inward? Why don't we retire behind our borders and let the rest of the world deal with those issues? But the answer to the reality of this interconnected world is not fragmentation, it is cooperation. History has told us time and again that any other route would be a tragic course. So how can we cooperate if cooperation is the rule of the game? You all have many ideas. I have some ideas, but I'm going to restrict to my field, our field and the IMF. If we take a macroeconomic perspective, the first priority must be to secure that fragile and weak recovery that I've referred to earlier on and lay the foundation for stronger and more equitable medium-term growth. Overcoming the voices of despair and exclusion requires an alternative path, one that leads to prospect for more employment, higher incomes, and more secure lives. So how do we go about it? And that's where I come to my, each country has to do it on its own. And the combination of all those actions will be greater than the, than the sum of the parts. So, each country should walk its own path. But each country will have a specific path. If you remember 2008, 2009, we all went okay, plus 2%, across the board, no distinction. Now it's different. It has to be different. It has to be country specific. But we see a general three-pronged approach spanning structural, fiscal, and monetary measures. Now, some of you will say, this is old, old hat tricks. We've been there. Well, maybe we've been there in the talk, but have we actually done it? And we believe that it's really time for implementation, going beyond the status quo, because we believe that these policies can be mutually reinforcing each other. If each country plays its part, these policies can add up to more, as I said, than the sum of its parts. Let's start with the structural reforms. As I said, structural, fiscal, monetary, structural reforms. There have been commitments on this front by the G20. For those of you who follow G20 act act activities, nations agreed that they would raise global GDP by an, an additional 2.1% by 2018. Well, we submit that, than, that rather than doing that casually over time, these measures should be accelerated and the work should be done in 2016. It has been announced. It's been made public. Let's accelerate it, front load the project. Now, what kind of structural measures are we talking about? The usual suspects would say product service market reform, labor market reforms. Well, this is nice headlines, but we need to drill down into the details of what needs to be done and what can actually be helpful for each country. Let me give you a few examples. If you take the United States, for instance, it can boost its labor supply by expanding the earned income tax credit. That's one option. By increasing the federal minimum wage and strengthening family-friendly benefits. Those are three areas that can actually deliver for the US market. Euro area countries can implement certainly better training and employment matching policies to help more people find jobs, especially the young people. For commodity exporters and for many low-income developing countries, increased diversification of the business model is the name of the game. They can no longer rely on one single commodity, as many have done. Now, these supply-side measures should be taken now. To maximize their benefits, however, and to offset any dampening effect on demand in the short term, they must be supplemented 
by supportive fiscal and monetary policy. Okay, let me explain what I mean by that. We believe that most countries can turn their fiscal policies into being growth friendly. And this can be done by simply not reducing the fiscal effort that is undertaken by some, but by shifting the composition of the measures, both on the revenue and on the cost side. Let me give you a few examples. India, which is by all accounts a success story, has had the benefit of the low oil prices, no doubt about it. But India has reduced spending on costly energy subsidies so that it can invest more in growth enhancing social infrastructure. That is underway, it is happening in India, and it's extremely helpful. In Japan, investing in childcare to help more women work, which will boost growth in the medium term. Clearly a market where the issue of labor supply is a big, big question mark. And Germany is implementing last year's plans to expand public investment by 17 billion euros in the years 2015 to 2018 each and every year. And it will also provide labor tax relief in 2016. Those are examples of those growth-friendly fiscal policies that have been decided. There's another way to deal with that fiscal side of things, which is to actually increase the efficiency of public spending. I'm not talking about the volume of it. I'm talking about the efficiency of it. Because if you look at one of the studies that has recently been completed by the IMF Fiscal Affairs Department, the difference between the most efficient spending and the least efficient spending is 100%. So you get twice as much growth with efficient public spending than you do with least efficient public spending. Investing in badly needed but well-constructed and efficient infrastructure is also an obvious area of great potential, both for the short term and for the longer term. I think we've discussed that many times over. I'm not going to go back into that. Another area which has been the subject of further study by the Fiscal Affairs Department is investing in innovation. That study, which is uh, soon to be published, or has just been published, has found that GDP in advanced economies could increase by 5% over the next two decades if private research and development investment was raised by 40%. And this would really entail a relatively small fiscal cost of about 0.4% of GDP per year, partly achieved through improved public spending and partly through better targeted tax incentives. That was really for the advanced economies because what we find clearly, particularly in the work that we're doing under the G20 Chinese presidency at their request, is that the, the, the type of fiscal spending, and the type of structural measures as well, will actually be a factor of where in the development cycle a country is. So in low income and developing countries, strengthening domestic resource mobilization, including by reducing energy subsidies, the direct and indirect cost of which is estimated at about $5.3 trillion, can create room for social spending even while rebuilding fiscal buffers. Now, all of that being said, it is clear that countries with high and increasing debt and elevated sovereign spreads need to pursue further fiscal consolidation. But not all countries are in that position, and some of them have actually room for fiscal expansion, and even more so if they commit to credible, well embedded in the legislative system, medium term objectives. There's one country that stands out to actually try to implement all those rules, and that is Canada. Canada stands out as one country making most of this space and adopting a new policy intended to actually boost growth in Canada, which has been heavily relying on high oil and gas prices. Now, we also 
take the view that countries should also prepare fiscally smart contingency measures that can be implemented promptly should downside risks materialize. No need to implement them yet, those additional measures, but prepare for them just in case. Structural reforms, fiscal measures, let me move now to monetary policy. It is the third prong to help deliver more durable growth. We believe that accommodative measures have played an invaluable role in supporting the global recovery. Across several major economies, this was achieved through successive rounds of quantitative easing combined with successive lowering of interest rates. And here I would like to commend the ECB, its board, President Draghi, for the steps that they have taken to improve confidence and financial conditions in the euro area. That will further support, and it has supported, the recovery. In this context, we see the recent introduction of negative interest rates by the ECB and the Bank of Japan, though not without side effects that warrant vigilance as net positives in the current circumstances. As far as the US Fed policy is concerned, we believe that the decision that was made in December and the determination to continue a monetary policy that will be data dependent is also appropriate. But having said all that, and while accommodation should continue in most advanced economies, it is clear that monetary policy cannot be the alpha and omega to recovery. And indeed, it will be much more effective if it is supported by fiscal policies and structural elements along the lines that I have just mentioned. It also needs to be supported by efficient transmission chan channels. High levels of non-performing loans, ranging from some countries in the European Union all the way to China, impede the positive effect of lower interest rates. And that is why it is important to strengthen bank balance sheets by enhancing prudential oversight, debt enforcement regimes, and insolvency frameworks. These measures are also vital for strengthening the financial sector as a whole, which is crucial for a growing economy. In emerging and developing economies, many grappling with the impact of weaker currencies on inflation and private sector balance sheets monetary policy should continue to adapt to circumstances. And there are many countries that should certainly be well advised to adopt flexible exchange rate policies in order to absorb the shocks that they suffer. As I said, whether it's structural reforms, fiscal policies, monetary measures, all of that has to go beyond the business as usual and the status quo in order to reach out of this risk of new mediocre, which we see much larger on the horizon. And as a result, some political red lines may have to be crossed and that will require courage on the part of the policymakers. Now, many of them will be tempted to quote forced on this issue. Die Botschaft hoch is wohl Allein mir fällt der Glaube. Well, well, maybe some are not speaking German in this room. Which translates into, this message I hear well, alone my faith is weak. Because there's always a good reason not to act. But that would be the wrong move. The growth momentum is weak. Risks are probably on the rise and confidence is sorely lacking. Otherwise, if there was confidence, we would see investments. We're not seeing investment. So it's time for leadership, and it's time for cooperation between the leaders. And there are, by the way, many issues that countries cannot tackle by themselves. These include shoring up global trade, Pressing ahead with the financial regulatory reform, tackling a range of global public good challenges ranging from climate change to managing flows of not only capitals but refugees to corruption. 
it is also essential to maintain a global strong financial safety net that protects countries from sudden liquidity shortages or external shocks, those innocent bystanders, as we like to call them. Well, during the crisis, the global community came together and addressed the weakness in the international monetary system. That was the 2010 reform of the IMF, which was clearly intending to reinforce the representativeness of the institution and doubling its quotas. That was the time when the Financial Stability Board was set up, reinforced. That was the time when the European Stability Mechanism was put in place. That was the time when central banks started strengthening their swap lines between themselves and carving out a more prominent role for the G20, soon to be under German presidency. The IMF was clearly a central part of this effort. The 2010 reform, finally, after laborious, uh, circumvoluted discussions, came to closure and implementation. And those resources, the permanent resources, have been doubled. And dynamic emerging markets have a better representation in the board of the IMF. But, you know what? China only still has a little 6% of the votes and the voices in the institution. Not exactly a mirror of what the global economy looks like. Which is why we're moving into the 15th review of the IMF quota, as well as possibly a revision of its formula, in order to make sure that there is proper representation, which is one of the conditions for it to be actually considered as legitimate to act on the basis of its 70 plus years of experience. So I believe that we need to revisit the global financial safety net, not to overhaul it, not to take the view that it is unsafe, no, but to make sure that there are no potential dark areas or countries that are left on their own without much by way of financial safety net precisely we need to reflect on the size of that safety net. Let me tell you a story. When I took my job back in 2011, the 2010 reform doubling the quota had not yet taken place. We had what we call the new arrangement to borrow. A group of countries had volunteered to put that in place. It's not hard capital, as bankers would know it. It's long-term loans. And then I looked at the balance sheet I had and I thought, I need to get on my bike and see whether we can raise some more money. So I went out to get some bilateral loans from many countries. The Europeans were first and foremost contributors under the circumstances, but many other countries, including the likes of Japan, China, many, many other countries contributed, and we put together a package of about 400 billion bilateral loans. So combined, the double quota the leftover of NABs, which has not been rolled into the quota, plus the still available bilateral loans, gives a capacity to commit which is, in our view, reasonable. But if any part of that construction is weakened or partly disappears because some say, well, the doubling of the quota is more than enough, that clearly reduces the capacity to commit of the institution at a time when I don't think that the risks will be coming out of small, minor, minor in GDP sense, countries, but possibly from larger corners of the world. We also need to consider ways to improve access, given that most emerging and developing countries are unable to use key elements of the current safety net. And finally, we need to improve the responsiveness to new challenges facing the international monetary system, from digital currencies to blockchain technology to cyber hacking, you name it. So we will be discussing that with the membership. And I believe that a well-resourced fund is actually a critical component of the global safety net, which otherwise comprises large reserves from countries. Is it the best use of reserves? Maybe not. Regional arrangements and also those swap lines between some countries, but certainly not covering the whole world. So we will do that. We will also 
be working to help countries identify the policy space, craft measures that they need, and build capacity. So we are deepening our work on structural reforms, capital flows, de-risking, domestic revenue mobilization. I will conclude very briefly, because I know that there is ample time that should be devoted to Q&As under uh, your moderation, um, Professor Ising. And I will quote again, um, Mr. Goethe, no German this time. He says, in the maxims and reflection of Goethe, it is not enough to know, we must also apply. It is not enough to will, we must also do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this brilliant speech. You covered so many topics. I think it's hardly one which was missing. Uh, and you masterly linked them together into a consistent picture of the global economy and the world. Um, I think your message was clear. No reason for alarm, but also no reason for complacency. I think this is a basic message. and. In this country, Germany, I think complacency has ended in the context of the refugee crisis. So uh, in this respect, uh, countries which seem to be in a good situation from, t from time to time need an exogenous shock. Uh, we didn't select it, but uh, it might also stir up uh, the discussion in, in this country. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have time for a very few questions, but this is no press conference. Please, the media have to wait until uh, Madame Lagarde uh, will give the interviews. So please, uh, who wants to raise a question? Uh, so you talked a lot about structural reforms and economic activity, so we are interested also in, in inflation, obviously. So one can think of that uh, supply-type reforms would first lower inflation, but then at some point also raise inflation. And I was wondering uh, whether you have any time profile in mind when inflation could pick up. Uh, so second question. Um, so there's this hypothesis that monetary policy, easing, ease monetary, easing monetary policy uh, would delay structural reforms. And I was wondering whether the IMF uh, looked at hard data and uh, has some evidence in favor or uh, against this, this hypothesis. And one last remark is that we've done some work in the research department of the Bundesbank and we found that actually uh, changes or a weakening in economic activity in China basically had uh, yeah, almost no negative effect on advanced economies, uh, the real, uh, real economic activity in advanced economies. And that's because of uh, the commodity price channel. So uh, you have weaker economic activity in China, lowest commodity prices, and this per se has uh, more favorable uh, effects on advanced economies, which seems to be a little bit in contrast to uh, what you were saying. Thank you. Well, the huge privilege you have is that you study the advanced economies predominantly. Uh, certainly, that was the last point that you made, uh, that you make. We have in charge 188 countries. And in that group of 188 countries, we have many more emerging and developing countries uh, to look after. And those ones, I can assure you, uh, from Latin America to Africa to some corners of Asia, are taking a hit as a result of the... Uh, the, uh, the, the, the Chinese legitimate and welcome changed policies that induces a lower growth rate. And although, you know, I've, I had very good and, and solid uh, discussions with the Chinese authorities, there are many commodities in which the actual volume has not declined significantly. But clearly, the, well, there's some where it has declined, uh, coal being one, for example. But the simple expectations from the world that the volume of iron ore, the volume of uh, some metals, uh, the volume of oil, 
the volume of coal is going to decline as resulted in uh, declining revenues for those suppliers. And uh, this is clearly uh, an effect that impacts not only those countries, but the global economy at large. And to argue that you know, a group of countries would be isolated and protected uh, from anything happening in China or in the Chinese supply chain, I think would be a little bit far-fetched. But I'd, I'd, I'd love, and you know, I'm not the ultimate expert in that, uh, in that respect, and our research department will take a very close look at the research work that you've done in that regard, uh, no doubt about it. Now, on the, um, on the issue of um, structural reform and the economic activity, uh, it may well be that structural reforms, for instance, taken in isolation, might have a slight dampening effect on inflation. And that's precisely the reason why we're saying that it has to be a three-pronged approach. It cannot be just structural reforms uh, as much as they are needed. It has to be accompanied by the other two uh, categories of measures that I have mentioned. If you take, for example, um, you know, I'm going to, to take an example which I, I said I would not take. But suppose for a second that you reform the labor market and that you insert a higher degree of flexibility which would facilitate mobility of labor. That might be resulting into dampening effect as a result of decisions made by companies to, for instance, restructure their workforce. That's going to be the short-term negative. Well, if you combine with that some fiscal measures that will sort of move the labor tax wedge and encourage employment by fiscal measures, then you trade off and you balance the immediate dampening effect that would have that structural reforms. So we are clearly advocating the combination of the three sort of working together. You know, I often think of a clock. If you only have one round turning, it's not going to have much of an impact. You need all those rotating together in order to actually move the needle to higher growth and higher employment and higher inflation as well. Do I have a time frame in mind? Well, I think we see, and I'm turning to the head of our European departments, because you clearly are focusing on Europe. There are corners of the world where inflation is not doing so badly. But I think we're seeing inflation picking up in about two years' time gradually, and then uh, heating um, the kind of levels that are expected clo close to, but below but close to the 2% in 2019. Anyway, I don't want to quote any specific year because I would refer you to the research work that we do, which is clearly far more sophisticated than my simple brain. Thank you so much. As you can imagine, Madame Lagarde has a very tight schedule. Uh, so we are very grateful that you took the time to come here. We are very honored by your presence, uh, by your speech. And uh, may I conclude saying many thanks. You have listened to use your words on Goethe of a true internationalist. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor.